show me your heart I know that it's beating Tell me that you love me too So I know your heart is true Cause I need some proof of love Cause I need some proof of love Cause I need some proof of love Hello, everybody, and welcome to Proof of Love. Today, we're going to be talking about sex trafficking, uh, sex work, all different kinds of things related to laws relating to those things, who's being protected, who's not being protected, the Trump administration, a whole bunch of interesting things around this subject. We covered it before, if you guys are interested with Naomi Brockwell early on in Proof of Love. But today, we're very happy to be joined by Elizabeth Nolan Brown. She's a senior editor at Reason, where she writes regularly on the intersections of sex, speech, tech, crime, politics, panic, and civil liberties. She's also the co-founder and the president of the libertarian feminist group, Feminists for Liberty. Uh, she's also written for the New York Times, Los Angeles Times, The Daily Beast, BuzzFeed, Playboy, Fox News, Politico, The Week, a whole bunch of others. So she's been covering this for a very long time. I remember when I first got involved in activism, seeing her work everywhere. So it's quite an honor to have her on. Before I say hello to her officially, though, uh, I'd love to say hello to my beautiful co-hostess. Hey, Lauren, how are you? Hey, I'm good. I'm really excited for today. And like Tatiana said, we're really honored to have you on. I have a lot of questions. I can't wait. Absolutely. So without further ado, thank you, Elizabeth, for joining us today on Proof of Love. Yeah, thank you guys so much for having me on. Awesome. So before we kind of dive into it, if you could give us a little bit of background on your work and what kind of drew you to these kinds of topics? Yeah, um, so I've been at Reason for uh, six years, a little over six years now. Uh, I've written about this uh, issues related to uh, what I kind of probably call sex policy, um, anything related to sort of sexuality and the law. Uh, I've written about these issues before coming to Reason, but not that wasn't sort of my primarily focus before that. Um, I've been a legal reporter, just covering all sorts of things. Um, I covered some tech policy stuff. I went for a few years into like women's health and nutrition blogging uh, right before I was at Reason. But when I came to Reason, I knew kind of one of the things I wanted to do was sort of you know combine different things I cared about and. Um, and maybe get some issues into reason that had just been historically undercovered, or at least undercovered from a certain perspective on, on a, the libertarian front. For instance, libertarians have actually been really good always about um, sex work and prostitution and, and you know, fighting for, for rights for sex workers and for decriminalization and fair treatment for the law. But it's always sort of come from a, uh, you know, we should be able to do with what we want with our bodies perspective. And really just sort of focused on this, like, oh, the philosophy of, like, you know, uh, a very philosophy-based perspective instead of sort of coming at it from looking at where people actually are and how these laws have harm actual people instead of just, you know, a sort of more philosophical view of it. So that was one of the things I wanted to do and that I've been able to do since coming to reason. And it's been very exciting. Um, but just, just, I sort of did come in with more of a sex worker rights focus when I was writing about these issues with more of a just sort of want to write about, you know, how dumb regulations were, were hurting sex workers who were happy with what they were doing otherwise, and now, you know, they couldn't because the law. But that sort of really got me into this whole arena of writing about sex trafficking or human trafficking, too, um, and writing about sort of the myths and hysteria that are surrounding it, because there's a lot of that, but also writing about you know, groups of people who aren't necessarily in sex work um, because they love it, but people who are still being harmed by our current policy. So it's sort of changed my focus over time. Okay, so you, you really touched on the crux of it, right? Uh -oh. How many people yeah. are happy to be having this job, right? What position, what amount of people that are being sex trafficked, you know, what number is that? What people are you know, willfully going into it, they're adults, they find some willing Johns, there's no violence, they maybe do their research, whatever, versus, you know, little kids or, or any kind, like, how does that break down? Because, you know, there is a lot of misconception around that. And how do you even get that data? 
Yeah, so to start with, actually, maybe it's just helpful to really quickly define a few terms. Um, you know, when we when I talk about sex work, I'm generally that's a you know a broad umbrella term that includes things that are both legal and illegal. It includes things like prostitution, which you know in most of the United States is illegal. It includes things like strip clubs and dominatrixes and pornography, which is legal here. Um, sex work generally when people are using it and when I'm using it now implies consent, implies autonomy, implies that someone is, you know, at least in some degree choosing to do this. They are not being forced into it. Um, sex trafficking is usually the term people use when they're talking about people who are being forced or coerced or when we're talking about people who are underage. In the United States, sex trafficking is defined as, um, you know, any prostitution that involves forced fraud or coercion or anytime anyone is under 18. And that doesn't, there doesn't have to be a trafficker, there doesn't have to be forced, it could just be a 17 year old who decided to, you know, to, you know, lie about their age and being involved in it, and that would still be considered sex trafficking. Um, so it's really hard to come by certain numbers, um, but one thing we do know is that a lot of the numbers about child sex trafficking in the United States are just hugely overblown. Um, there's these statistics like, 300,000 uh, children a year will be trafficked or, or are at risk of being trafficked. And it's all sort of based on these studies that, you know, the, uh, the authors themselves have now debunked, that, that myriad people have debunked, but there's a lot of activists that are really invested in, in sort of spreading them. And we can talk more about that in a little bit if you want. But to answer your sort of, your first broader question about, you know, how many people are involved in this by, because they're happy, how many people are sort of just doing it because it's the best they can do. I think it's really important for us actually to sort of move beyond that conversation, um, that binary. And this is what a lot of people who are in, you know, sort of um, both sex worker rights activism and, you know, sex trafficking victim or, or you know, violence against women victim groups are, are saying is that, you know, we really need to, it, it's not so black and white. I mean, there are obviously black and white situations, you know, there are obviously these people who are, you know, gotten to sex work because they just love it and they're making a ton of money and they've, you know, never really had a lot of big issues. Um, there are people who are, you know, who are being forced. I'm not saying that that doesn't happen, that there aren't people who are, you know, being stuck in it literally against their will. But for, I think, a huge amount of people, it's, you know, it's a job like anything else and there's a lot of ambivalence. There's a lot of good and there's a lot of bad. Um, you know, as a lot of sex workers will point out, sometimes people get into it as a victim um, because, you know, they, they might have a violent or coercive boyfriend or pimp who gets them into it. But then when, so, you know, they might be considered a sex trafficking victim, but then after that, they start working on their own. So it's, you know, it's, it's hard to sort of talk about it in those black and white terms. And I think the important part too is that we don't really need to in order to have a productive conversation because regardless, people are asking for decriminalization or showing how criminalizing it makes it worse for everybody. So it's not like, oh, you know, victims need one thing and sex workers need another thing and we should figure out how many are of you know each because one solution will help them, but that's at odds with the other one. You know, it actually turns out, you know that policies that will help one group always will help the other, I think. So I have a question. I'm wondering if you noticed the time where things started to shift because I know growing up, you heard sex trafficking or human trafficking and it was that kind of consistent same idea with women being promised jobs or nannies from other countries. And that was kind of, and then forced into sex work, whether it was here in, in other countries. But I've noticed that there's a turn over the past couple years with that term also being used, I think in a positive way for underage kids, maybe not at the 17 year old mark or at 17, but even younger, like 14, 15. I've heard a lot of it in the UK that are kind of turned by pimps and are forced into the life. And back in the day, they would be the ones that were jailed and now they're looked at as victims, which for the most part, for most of them, they are. But there, there are always those exceptions. And I wonder when that kind of term broadened and if there was a specific reason why it broadened. Yeah, so it's actually, it's really interesting. There's, there's a lot of sort of research on this um, in, in academic research. And 
Um, I don't know if you might remember, some people might remember that, you know, in the sort of 80s and 90s, um, you know, I was sort of too young to really remember this going on, but now I've read a lot about, you know, the uh, sort of feminist porn wars, where, you know, you had a group of feminists who were like, you know, this is, you know, women can participate in porn, it's not all slavery, and then you have the, you know, Andrea Dworkin and Catherine McKinnon crowd who were like, no, I mean, all porn is rape, I mean, also, you know, all, all sort of, a lot, lot of heterosexual sex is rape, any sort of, you know, objectification of women is bad and we need to ban it. And at that point, this group of feminists, that, that latter group, which, you know, radical feminists, sort of teamed up with uh, conservative, social conservatives, to sort of try and ban porn or intensely regulate it. And when that sort of both both fizzled out, like I guess we'll just say fizzled out as a cause um, towards the end of the 90s, they started then shifting towards prostitution and being anti-prostitution. And this was an explicit strategy um, starting since you know, the late 90s and around the turn of the century to try and conflate all prostitution with sex trafficking. And there are these documents that these different groups of activists that are anti-prostitution groups have, um, you know, that have that show that this was their whole strategy was to confuse the boundaries of prostitution and sex trafficking so that all prostitution, even involving adults who are consenting, was defined as sex trafficking. And I think it's been a slow burn. It's taken a long time to get there. But we are actually seeing that now. And, and this is separate, just real quick, from, your, from the children issue. I'll come back to that in a second. Because I think, you know, yeah, overall, it's it's very dangerous and it's definitely been deliberate um, and it's, you know, sort of seeded into the federal government now where, you know, the Department of Homeland Security and the FBI are giving police departments around the country training on how all prostitution is trafficking and all sex workers are victims, which then, you know, justifies going in and arresting them and throwing them in jail and these very carceral solutions. Um, you know, with regard to people who are underage, I want to be clear that I don't think that it should be legal for them to be involved in prostitution at all. But a lot of what we've seen, too, in the past decade or so is it, it was illegal already for, for to have sex with underage, people who are underage, even teenagers, you know. And it was illegal to force people into prostitution. These were accomplished through a lot of different laws under state prostitution statutes, whatever. But when people started getting sex trafficking on their minds, politicians were like, we've got to do something about it. So they explicitly passed laws saying, okay, now sex was already illegal, pretty much, but they, they made this big deal about how, you know, now it's illegal and they've defined it as such and such and made a big deal about it. And they've a lot of times said what you said, that's sort of the big line, is that part of this is about treating people who are victims as victims and not arresting them, and especially when it comes to underage people. And I think that's great. And if that was what was happening in practice, that would be really great. But um, we see still across the country that teenagers who are involved in prostitution are detained and arrested and they are, you know, it, they are caught up in stings where FBI agents will go in and, you know, have them strip for them and then send in a SWAT team to arrest them. Sometimes they don't actually charge them. Um, not all, they do sometimes, but sometimes, you know, often they won't actually charge them, but still the, that, that whole thing is just so scary and terrifying and they'll say well we have to do that for their own good and it's just it's, it's a very backwards way of looking at things i think okay so there's a lot of things to unpack <laughs> in there right yeah. um so let's leave the kids on the you know on the side right you've got a movie like hustlers j-lo's looking amazing she's flawless but you know they're kind of hustling guys you've got cardi b who used to be a stripper, and now everybody's kind of glorifying that. I think it's kind of hard to reconcile the idea that, you know, sex work, is that good for society? Is that bad for society? Uh, does it provide companionship? And, you know, are we incentivizing certain things or not? It's obviously the oldest profession for a reason. What has been your experience speaking to maybe the glorification of that kind of culture versus the actual results of, of living that kind of a lifestyle? I'd say I really try to avoid getting into sort of what messages things send, um, you know, or, or, you know, whether or not things are good from a, like, grand societal standpoint, right? I think that that gets us into a lot of danger. Um, because ultimately, I think it is about 
individuals and you know who are being harmed by these laws that make what they do illegal and make it harder for when people are coerced to get help because you know they can't they can't go to the cops their clients can't go to the cops you know um, or if they're actually sexually assaulted by by whoever they can't you know get help a lot of times because they worry about being arrested um there are all sorts of harms that that our criminalization scheme and our current way of treating it uh deals out to individuals and i think that's where I like to focus because I don't, I don't really care, I guess, like whether or not it's good or bad. I don't think that that's the point. There are a lot of jobs that we don't really, you know, we don't worry about whether or not they're good or bad for society before we let them be legal, before we let people do them without literally like tossing them in jail, you know, like we don't worry about whether stage acting or DJing or serving fast food or all these different things, you know, like a lot of these might be not necessarily great for society. And I also think that this kind of is a, you know, this is a thing I like to say a lot to, to social conservatives and, and people who are anti-prostitution is that, you know, I don't think that there's a libertarian position on whether or not prostitution is morally good or bad. Um, and I'm not really in it to talk about that. It, what I want to focus on is that whatever, you know, you don't have to like prostitution, you don't have to like sex work, you don't have to like pornography. But it should be about changing them, like hearts and minds and behavior on those things, not about creating laws to ban it, because all that does is harm the people who are in it. And those are the people that people say they want to help, and then they end up harming with this stuff. Well, kind of piggybacking on that, and I think we were just saying that um, that's a great answer, really. <laughs> but um, is there a way that sex work is safe? I mean, are there countries that are really doing it right? Obviously, there's always exceptions, but... Are there places that are doing it right? Is there such thing as safe sex work these days for people who yeah. are in it willingly? Obviously. Yeah, I think I think definitely that there are, and we see it more. And, and unfortunately, we've had a lot of countries, even in, in Europe, where things were safer, sort of start to crack down because they've gotten influenced by this sort of a trafficking hysteria. But you know, when there are a lot of things that help keep sex workers safer, and they talk about this, and it's amazing how if you look at sex workers from, you know, um, India to South Africa to Nigeria to France to the United States to Canada, like, it doesn't matter. Like, anywhere around the globe, you look at what, what groups of organized sex workers are saying, and it's always the same demands, um, which is to be decriminalized, because one of the things, one of the biggest things is that when people do sexually assault them, clients, when that does happen, um, or if that, you know, does happen, I'm not saying but if that does happen, they can't, you know, they can't get justice for themselves and they can't get that person off the street. Um, they say that a lot of the violence comes from cops. I mean, that's a, a huge thing we hear. And I think that that's unfortunately very true. Um, again, not saying that like all cops are doing that, but we, there's so many, there's so many examples just even in the U.S. where cops extort sex or which essentially rape sex workers by telling them they're going to arrest them if they don't do it. Um, on a, on a less, you know, just sort of legalistic view, though, like, I think a lot of the things that, that keep people safe and that, they, that sex workers routinely talk about wanting are things that are just sort of ancillary to the criminalization system, but things like working together. I mean, like, if you can have a place where several sex workers can work together and they can hire a bodyguard or, the, you know, things like that, they can, they can actually do that. They can advertise online and then screen their clients in advance, you know, and actually make them go. I mean, a lot of sex workers I know, you know, they make their clients submit a, a real ID and references and things like that. All of this stuff is, is put in jeopardy. All these safety mechanisms are put in jeopardy by our laws because, you know, um, right now there's been a big focus on taking down sex work ads too, on the theory that that's somehow perpetuating sex trafficking instead of just being as sex workers say a safer place for them to advertise a lot of times anybody who works with any sex workers and is paid by them can be arrested as a pimp or trafficker so if you have someone who's hired to be a bodyguard or you have someone who is hired to drive someone to a job and wait outside the motel so that you know they are safe they can be arrested and often are arrested even when it's other sex workers as traffickers themselves and even in countries like uh, in the UK, where some versions of sex work are legal, um, it's illegal for sex workers to work together because then that's considered a brothel. So even if you just have two sex workers who want to be, you know, working from the same apartment or house so that they can help keep each other safe, then that's criminalized. So I think, yeah, it's it, a lot of the things that we use 
in this misguided way to try and keep sex workers or, or you know victims safer is actually the things that make them you know more more in danger. Well, it's also interesting because I've noticed in the past few years that webcamming has been huge. It and that has. It feels like that's probably, I mean, across the board, a, safe, a safer way to do it. You're usually, from what I've researched, oftentimes, th there are people that do it in their own homes, but there are also places where these women go and they rent out a room and that's their web room and there are other people there too. And it's almost like a non-physical sex brothel. Like, I yeah. wonder, yeah, what do you think about that? Because I wonder how that kind of really exploded and if it has to do with maybe those safety measures also. Definitely safety measures and putting in performers and women. I mean, not all performers are women, but you know, it, it does tend to be very gendered. So, um, putting putting women in control of their own work. Um, I, I've been I uh, wrote about this just earlier this year. Um, I was out at the AVN, the Adult Video Network Awards, out in Las Vegas this past January. I was also out there like four years ago. Um, and one of the things that's been interesting to see is the webcams just take over. I mean, even in that four year span, like there was a little bit of webcamming presence and now it's just like running the thing. AVN first introduced, like they have a, an award for best webcam and stuff. And a lot of people I talked to, a lot of, of women performers in the industry, um, have talked about how like, yeah, that's just such a game changer. Things like webcamming or like OnlyFans and, and various sites like that um, where people can, where, where they can reach out directly to clients and sort of set their own prices for videos or pictures or live, you know, web shows or whatever. And yeah, not only does it mean that they're being able to do stuff from like the safety of their own homes or a designated space that they're choosing, but also that there's not as many middlemen. You know, you don't have to rely on some exploitative like manager or I mean, I'm not saying that they're all, but you know, like a lot of times, unfortunately, it seems like in porn, there are still a lot of people under this old model that really relied on exploitative managers and exploitative production companies to sort of service middlemen and sort of say, all right, like you can be in, you can be out. And if you wouldn't do all this crap that, you know, some exploitative people wanted you to do, then they would just block you see from the business and whatever. And now like, people can actually just be like, well, screw you. Like, I'm just going to do this and reach my fans directly. And so it's given an amazing, yeah, amount more control to performers. And it's actually sort of, there was this, I mean, there's sort of been this like me too reckoning in the porn um, industry sort of brewing and it's been shooting its head up and down. There was a, a, another sort of bout of it a couple of weeks ago. And it's been really interesting to see because it's also been sort of giving um, women the, the like, uh, what they need to be able to call out to people who have long been figures in their industry that they said that a lot of people talk behind the scenes about being bad and you know told each other secretly whisper networks not to work with this performer or not to work with this producer because they might you know let stuff happen and now they're actually able to come out there and say that without worrying about being just blacklisted from the industry and never able to work again okay so there's a few things that I wanted to ask about that, but I'm going to go straight to the thing that's on people's minds lately, right? Wayfair, there's this big scandal. <laughs> uh, the next day, all of these people were saying, look, we asked Wayfair. They said it's not a sex scandal. It seems fine to us. And then, you know, they very quickly moved along from that story. But while I think maybe it seems a little bit far-fetched that they're actually shipping children in cabinets, is there anything to the to the way that people would be able to transfer money and children online? And what do you think of that specific scandal? You know, have you looked into it at all? And and or is it just something that people make fun of? I mean, it seems a little sketchy. Yeah. Um, no, I mean I I believe them when they say it was a glitch. I think um it's shocking how much monitoring of online transactions that um globally and in the United States that our federal government is doing. They have these so many different agencies uh, set up to sort of tell banks how to monitor transactions and to look for signs. They're, they all have these risk, you know, risk factors for human trafficking. There's a huge industry devoted to sort of monitoring this. So I don't, I don't really think that we have to worry about like that, you know, I mean, it's just, Epstein got with away this, with it, right? So, like, there's obviously some right, kind but of Epstein government. wasn't doing anything secret. I mean, that's that's what's kind of crazy. I think that when we when we think about this, there's always people want to have these really fantastical, like, movie like scenarios, and that's actually a not required because we see like all you need to be is a powerful person like Epstein, who literally was going around with Donald Trump and like 
Les Wexner, the guy who owns like Victoria's Secrets and half of the mall stores in America, and just all these people. And you know, they've they've known this forever. Like he was all this evidence that is now that was now against him in the past years was out in 2007, eight, and people just suppressed it. I and mean, he didn't have to. He didn't have. He was flying on commercial airlines, or he was you know flying from his own jet. People knew about it. Everybody was there. Like. I don't think we need to, to find sort of conspiracy theories. I think that oftentimes when it comes to powerful people, um, we just sort of let them get away with stuff and ignore it. Um, I also think that, you know, one of the big things that I found in, in covering this is that I've not found a single case that is ever like the movies, sex trafficking. Um, I've never found people being, uh, you know, abducted or ferreted into the country and stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that that never happens, but the vast, vast majority of cases look more like a teenage runaway who left their parents' house and got caught up with someone who said that they loved them and then, you know, has two or three young girls that they, that, you know, teens that they did that to. Or someone who is on drugs and has a abusive, like, you know, a manager who keeps them, you know, uh, doing things to get jobs or who thinks that they're in love, like a domestic abuse situation. Those are the things, and those things I do think, you know, that's not uncommon. And that's what people don't want to talk about, though. Who would rather, I think, focus on these crazy, you know, conspiracies that sort of, you know, implicate all these, these nuts of, like, you know, big actors and stuff. But, but a lot of times it's just, it's sad, but it's just, it's much quieter and it's about, sort of providing resources too. Like a, a one big problem is that like, you know, there's no shelters, there's not enough shelters for people who are like trying to flee abusive partners, for kids who are run away. And then if you get an arrest, you're banned from shelters. So if anybody gets any prostitution arrest, which a lot of them do, then they have nowhere to go. So it's like, I feel like we should be focusing more on things like that, but people really want to kind of focus on these, you know, these wilder things. Cause it's not as, it's not as interesting to be like, we need more money for shelters. <laughs> Well, I was also wondering about massage parlors and kind of things in, uh, particularly <laughs> there are a lot in Manhattan and LA and pretty much any big city really, where it's the whole like, you know, rub and tug and all that like happy ending and things like that. And I've seen them, not myself firsthand, but I've had friends that have gone in for a massage and then been offered, maybe not with the term happy ending, I'm curious with places like that, because I'm sure that there, there are women being trafficked into those places, but I'm sure there are also people that are doing that for some extra money, and maybe they're choosing to do that. I'm wondering how the government views massage, massage places, like oh, the versus prostitution, kind of on the street. Like, is there a big difference there? I mean, I'm just, I'm just so curious about that. Lately, massage parlors have become pretty much the number one site for our government to do prostitution things. Um, there's a huge, again, federal government, largely the Department of Homeland Security, to send uh, to have federal agents work with local police departments to do what are essentially just good old fashioned prostitution things at vice um, at massage parlors, and then arrest people for either prostitution or getting massages without a license. Um, I just wrote, I've actually, I wrote a big feature for Reason Magazine about this, the cover story for us uh, back in, it was in our April issue, and I just uh, wrote another big piece about a uh, job senator, Josh Holly from Missouri, one of these big massage parlor busts that he did. I've done actually a lot of research on this issue, and um, it, it, I've sort of tracked, I've tracked a lot of individual cases. It is always 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 them saying we're going to stop a human trafficking ring we are going to stop a sex trafficking ring sending in vice cops or fbi agents or homeless ice agents to get hand jobs from old asian women and then arresting them for unlicensed massage or prostitution or money laundering because money laundering can just be doing anything with illegal proceeds um, I, I suggest everyone check out, it's called Massage Parlor Panic on Reason.com. I also just wrote one, if you go to my Twitter page, um, E.N. Brown, it's a pinned tweet about Josh Hawley's big thing where he said he took down an Asian sex trafficking ring and it's three years later and all they charged was eight people for misdemeanor occupational licensing violation, not having the right state license to give a massage. Um, it's just a whole super racist and classist boondoggle really is, is my thoughts on that. Um, during the Obama administration, it was sort of, uh, it, it started and it was a big sort of um, 
it was much more centered on the idea that they were saving sex trafficking victims and now um but it still was just the same thing and now you see it even more so under the trump administration um it seems very much like an immigration enforcement effort really designed to sort of try and find undocumented immigrants um you also see people arrested for that so it's yeah it's really sad and as i um I don't want to ramble on about this too long, but just as I um, I wrote in this recent piece about Holly, again, like you said, like this is a particularly vulnerable population, um, right, of people who are who are both immigrants and sometimes undocumented immigrants and sex workers, and so it does, you know, they they are you know more vulnerable to, for labor violations, um, and and you know sexual violations. But unfortunately, I, I, you know, but there are tons that are doing it by choice. Um, I can see that again and again in this research too. And unfortunately, we're not able to save and, and help the people who are, you know, maybe in exploitative situations because again and again, the cops are just sending in or sending in police or federal agents to arrest them for these kind of bullcrap things like these, you know, licensing violations and then not really worrying about, you know, sort of, um, more, but I don't know. It's just if if people knew, if, if these people knew their rights, you know, like we need to make sure that they know that they don't have to work. Like this, this one case, it was like maybe had to work a lot of hours, but they weren't being forced into prostitution. And instead, people were, like the, the cops were so focused on proving that, and then when they couldn't, just like arrest the people for sex work, that they just sort of ignore. Like maybe we should just work on making sure that you know there aren't more mundane labor violations being you know perpetrated here. So. Yeah, no, that's so that's so interesting that you said that because they're being exploited for something completely different. It's just anytime anybody is exploited and they're particularly that kind of vulnerable population, it's just that's so sad. It's just so yeah. sad. Yeah, but sometimes maybe people want that ability. You know, that's the that's the thing that's hard to be able to tell, right? Some people are there willingly and some people aren't. So it's really right. Uh, but I mean that's yeah, I think this is again like where the decrim thing comes because like again, like if sex work was decriminalized, like they could just be openly being like, look, this is a hybrid massage parlor, or, like this is an erotic massage parlor, you know? And then if someone was being forced or whatever, I mean like there'd be just much more opportunities for other other visitors to the massage parlor to notice that stuff and go to the cops for but you know, they can't do that now because then they'll be arrested for for getting a happy ending, you know? So um I just think yeah, it's we'd be a lot better positioned to sort out who actually did need help and who were just sort of forcing cops on if we had a deep system. What about um, child protective services? Um, I have heard a lot of criticism that a lot of children go missing into the system, but they're supposed to be protecting them. So how does that play into that? I mean, is there some responsibility from these government organizations that are supposed to be helping the children and there maybe have some failings there? Yeah, I mean, it's shocking how many, I forget what the statistics exactly are, but if you look up how many people who are, um, you know, deemed, who are who are underage and involved in, you know, survival sex or being out on the streets trading, trading sex for a place to stay and do or who are, who are wind up being, you know, forced or coerced by someone into sex work, um, how many of them came from foster care or from state care. Um, you know, on, on a certain level, that's, you know, these are people who are already in, to be placed in those situations in the first place. They were, uh, you know, youth who were in a precarious situation. So it makes sense that there'd be some more level of, you know, people running away and things like that. But it does also really make you question like what is going on in our state care system that is making so many kids prefer to run away and live on the streets and try like trading sex for survival than being in these situations that the state had placed them in. Um, and then the way that we sort of deal with that when, when these kids do get involved in prostitution um, is that it's, it's just really bad. Like there was this one case in Texas where this, you know, um, this guy got charged for driving this uh, girl who was 17 to a uh, hotel to meet someone for sex. And she had a fake ID saying she was 19 and she told him she was 19 and she was involved sex. Who knows? Anyways, though, they crowed about, like, they put out all these press releases the FBI did about how they caught this sex trafficker and it made it sound like this guy who did it. But the, the teen had 
they then revealed run away from home three times. Every single time they found her back on like getting involved in sex work to make money to get by. And all they kept doing was returning her to her foster parent. Like what what must have been going on in that? I mean, you know, like in that family, why would you just keep clearly there's something not right there? And it's just, I don't know. I think we've got this, we've kind of got this very backwards way of looking at this. And it's it's a bit it is a big problem. It's really scary. Yeah, it doesn't sound like they're uh, always keeping them so safe. So where do people go from here? I mean, the world is so overwhelming. We've got COVID on the brain. We've got elections coming up. And this seems to be an ongoing problem. There seems to be a growing interest among people. What, from a practical perspective, if somebody's listening to this, where do they go with some of these feelings? I think that there's a lot of need for maybe more education before barreling in and signing this petition or that one, because you don't know, right? Sometimes it says, oh, save the children petition for this wonderful law. And then it has very bad outcomes. So where are some good sources that people can get some guidance and some education, would you say? Yeah, I'd say one thing I just always tell people to do first of all is just when you see headlines let's say sex trafficking or human trafficking and you see maybe an initial paragraph in the news that says you know eight people ten people 30 johns arrested in you know such a read down a few paragraphs because almost always it will then actually say that it was just cops posing as an adult sex worker and people um, men reaching out to them, or that it was just sex workers themselves charged with prostitution or whatever, or there was a massage parlor with licensing violations. I think just asking people, just just like, just for your own edification, you know, like look critically at, at sex trafficking stories, it's actually sort of being said beyond um, just the statements. You know, police will say, we did a huge sex trafficking investigation, but then look at what they charge. If they only didn't charge anyone with anything but, you know, misdemeanor or whatever, then like, they're probably just sort of trying to make a big deal and make themselves look like heroes. Um, so I think that's that's a good place to start. Um, there's some there's a lot of stuff out there about if you're curious about like the numbers, um, debunking sort of uh, some of the, the you know really drastic numbers about human trafficking. Um, Glenn Kessler at the Washington Post, who's the fact check columnist, has written a number of them. Um, I've written a few. Snopes has done some. Um, and if you just sort of Google a lot around like, you know, sex trafficking numbers and myths, you know, you can um, you find some of those or people are free to reach out to me on Twitter and I can just send you some links too. And then I'd say third, maybe look into just sex worker rights organizations. There's a lot of them. Um, and there's, you know, especially ones based around different cities, I think, or different sort of interest groups. And like um, Red Canary Song is one in Brooklyn that's largely focused on Asian and migrant sex workers and largely massage parlor workers. Um, It was named after Yang Song, this woman who uh, plummeted to her death during a sting on, it was a massage parlor worker during a a prostitution sting on her business in Queens. And um, so I think just sort of looking at following some different sex worker rights groups and seeing just, you know, if you're, if you're, like you said, you're not ready to like be convinced of anything yet, but just sort of listen to what listen to what sex workers themselves are saying, listen to what a diverse group of sex workers are saying, you know, not just like the people who get quoted in, you know, big like New York Times articles about how great or bad sex work is, because I feel like that's all the media tends to do is like, like, you know, like, okay, talk about like the happy hooker and it's like, just either totally glamorize it or just be like, no, everybody's a sex pain. And I think it's really important just like follow people on Twitter where sex workers can talk for themselves and you can actually listen to their real stories. Awesome. Thank you so much. Lauren, did you have any final questions before we wrap? I know this is, you really like this topic. I don't know I, why you like it. You like well, weird I, crime things. I, I do have a weird crime thing. And I was telling Tatiana, I like when I was really, really young, when the Balkan Wars were going on, I just was like so horrified by what was happening there. And I know that there's it from that war and in that whole area in Eastern Central Europe, there like is a real issue with human trafficking. And when you start to hear that it's like the numbers are so gigantic here in the States and it's like, what? how could it happen here? It's, you don't want it to happen anywhere. It's something I'm super passionate about. I think slavery of any kind that's still happening in the world is just like horrendous. Like what can you do to help? 
but it's slightly, you know, more than slightly reassuring to hear that those numbers are, you know, inflated here and that we still predominantly have a safe country in most ways. Yeah. And it feels good to hear that. And that the solutions, I think, are more in reach, you know, that we don't have to worry about global, global international t trafficking cabals. We need to just worry yeah. about tackling, like, poverty and, you know, basic criminal problems in our own backyards that I think are a lot more, I mean, that are still very tragic, but are a lot more manageable for people. Can I, yeah. and can I add one more thing, too? Yeah. Um, the first, like, big feature I wrote for Reason about this is called The War on Sex Trafficking is the New War on Drugs. And I've got a lot, a lot about the statistics in there. So I suggest like that is might be a good place for people to look if they want to sort of a primer on sort of how we kind of got to the situation with all this sort of um, different myths about it and, and sort of, you know, where that's come from and sort of tearing apart the different numbers. Has there been a change in recent times? I think we touched on this before, but, you know, people say, oh, now we're going to, we're getting so much better because I know that you have some of these pieces on your website and yeah some of them are from 2016 2017 and i wonder well has there been this big improvement or anything since then or what would you say on that front and is trump really great on this subject uh no i'd say i mean um <laughs> this is kind of a complicated answer because i say trump has done less on the sex trafficking front than obama era department of justice did that's actually a blessing in disguise because basically all that either of them has done has been arrest adult sex workers and their clients. So, um, yeah, so I think there's, there's not really any evidence that Trump has been, you know, like doing anything more. I think that he's focused a lot more on, on sort of using a sort of anti-immigration rhetoric around it. Um, there was a, there was some stuff about how child sex trafficking prosecutions have actually decreased under Trump. But again, I don't want to say that as a, as, as a knock on him either, because again, like a lot of them are, like I said, like sort of similar cases. So the fact it's, it's sort of hard to say. I do think it is though, one of the, one of the shifts I have seen in recent years is that like um, the, the sex worker rights movement and the decrim movement has really been gaining ground. Like D, uh, DC, there were 14 hours of testimony on a bill to decriminalize prostitution in DC this past year. Um, you just see movements in New York and like all sorts of different cities. And even four years ago or so, like that was, that was, I don't know. I think there was a lot more for track. And it, it's, it's a testament to how great like sex worker activism and people in this sphere have been. And also I think to our general sort of criminal justice reform, especially like right now and, you know, um, ending abusive policing being a big thing. And I hope that this kind of becomes more of a part of it about the way that these laws are used. Uh, Actually, awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time out to educate us and the audience here at Proof of Love. And people can, of course, check out Elizabeth's work. Uh, she's very active on Twitter. I follow her over <laughs> there. And then you're also over at Reason and a number of other places. So thank you so much for joining us. And yeah, we'll see thank everybody. You. Thanks so thank much. You. We'll see you thank all next you. time on Proof of Love. Bye. Do you like cryptocurrency, politics, economics, activism, or art? Then check out The Tatiana Show, where you can learn all about it in a fun and non-intimidating way, as if you're just hanging with friends. Go to thetatianashow.com and listen now. Proof of Love has been brought to you by CryptoMediaHub.com, a boutique marketing and PR agency for Bitcoin and beyond. Show me your heart. Cause I need some proof of love Cause I need some proof of love Cause I need some proof of love Thank you for listening to Proof of Love. Please follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Proof of Lovecast. More episodes can be found at proofoflovecast.com. And make sure you leave a review on iTunes and tell your friends. You are listening to Proof of Love with Tatiana Moroz, Dr. Stephanie Murphy, and Lauren Kasovitz. This show may contain adult content, language, and humor and is intended for mature audiences. If that's not you, please stop listening. Nothing you hear on Proof of Love is intended as financial advice, legal advice, therapy, or really anything other than entertainment. Please take everything that you hear with a grain of salt. 
Oh, and if you're hearing us on an affiliate network, the ideas and views expressed on this show are not necessarily those of the network that you're listening on or of any of the sponsors or affiliate products that you may hear about on the show.